happen. All right, everyone. All right, everyone. Well, um, we're going to talk about a sad subject of beech leaf disease. Many of us are aware it's throughout our state. I've given this talk before, um, and I've been told by my audiences that I need to prepare them that this is a sad subject, and most of you probably are home, so grab your uh, favorite teddy bear or your blanket for comfort because uh, we're going to hear some sad news, but we will end and discuss ways that we can uh, mitigate the, the negative aspects, and hopefully we can... Um, have some beach last through this devastating disease. So let me just start off with saying that Rutgers uh, University is an equal opportunity provider and we promote justice for all. So we're gonna be reviewing multiple topics, the identification of beach, beach leaf disease symptoms, um, the pathology of beach leaf disease, the ecology of beach, what's at stake, trial treatments, experimental options, land management considerations, and tree replacement. So um, before I go too much farther, if anybody's not muted, please do me a favor and mute. Thank you so much. Okay, so just to review, if you're not familiar, we have two main species of beach in the state. The first is American beech, and American beech are found in forests primarily and native landscapes. And you can see in the, uh, the map in the center of your screen, in green is where are the majority of our forests are. Beech occupies many of these areas. But we also find beech in our developed landscapes. We find American beech on the fringes of forests and these developed landscapes throughout the pink areas shown on this map. European beech is an exotic beech. It is um, planted in our developed landscapes and it's very common throughout New Jersey. A lot of times our, um, our European beech are planted because of their beautiful purple leaves. There's many different cultivars, and unfortunately, all of them are susceptible to beech leaf disease as well as our American beech. There is not on this page, but there's also um, Vegas Orientalis, which is a uh, uh, oriental beech, and that is not so common, so we didn't really list it here, but it is also susceptible to beech leaf disease. Now, some European beech do not have purple leaves. So if you aren't sure which beach you have, the best way to tell the difference is when the leaves emerge and by the leaf shape. So our American beach is toothed and it has um, a pointy tip, while the European beach has more of a wavy leaf margin, not really pronounced pointy teeth on the edges, a shorter, rounder leaf. Okay, so beech leaf disease has entered the United States in Cleveland, Ohio. You can see in the white area um, just below Lake Erie on the map that came, the beech leaf disease came in in 2012. Since then, it has spread mostly eastward, but also north, a little west, and a little south. And it spread rapidly. We, we've been able to document decline of our beach, and unfortunately we know that without any sort of treatment or intervention, mature beach can die within six to 10 years, and saplings can die within two years. Now just note, the spread is mostly eastward, and we're gonna be talking about vectors and um, potentially that our um, wind and rain are have much to do with the um, the transmission and the pattern of spread. So, beech leaf disease symptoms. You can see here on these leaves, there's opaque banding, and you can see the best when you hold it up against a light source like the sky. So this is a very diagnostic feature of infected leaves. And um, the, it's almost like a striping pattern. 
sometimes early on an early infection, you can't really tell by looking down on a leaf if it has beech leaf disease. But if you hold it up against the, so the sky and you see some opacity, that's a sign that um, you're, th you're at the beginning phases of beech leaf disease infection. The, now this tissue is malformed. The thick opaque, the areas that are opaque become thickened and they also suppress photosynthesis and they make it harder for the leaf in general to photosynthesize. Over time, they start to shrivel up and then trees begin to defoliate. So therefore, um, trees are struggle to photosynthesize when their leaves are infected and defoliating and eventually dieback ensues. Here are a couple more shots that my associate Pete Nietzsche took and shared with me. And these um, are showing, exhibiting a chlorotic scenario where um, there's yellowing associated with the banding. So you can sometimes find that, but you really need to double check and hold it up against the sky or a light source to make sure that you have that opacity occurring. Um, so next, here's just a couple shots of a European beach um, losing its canopy on the left and then an American beach on the right. Dieback ensues and um, over time, uh, the, the, can the entire canopy will be lost. What we're seeing is that the, the dieback and the leaf infection occurs first in the lower canopy and usually moves upward. So... At, for just an exam to show an example of how fast this infection spreads, um, here's a forest uh, primarily of beech in um, right on the edge of Somerset County and Morris County. And this had one less than 1% infected leaves. So you can barely even see them in this photograph. This was an October photo before the leaves fell. Now, less than a year later in August, we have greater than 50% um, infected leaves, in, uh, especially in the understory. So it's pretty shocking how fast this disease can spread, in, especially in beach dominant forests. So let's review some uh, pathogenesis and what we know. So beech leaf disease is caused by an invasive microscopic animal it's a round worm, not a worm, but it's a nematode. Lydilentius cranate subspecies mechanii is its Latin name. It doesn't have a common name yet, so we can refer to it as LCM. It is, we do not know exactly where it comes from. The assumption is it is not from this um, continent because it's extremely virulent and spreading very quickly. The assumption is it is exotic and therefore invasive because of the harm it's causing. However, researchers out of Connecticut and have partnered with the USDA and researchers in Japan to determine its origin because it's closely related out this nematode to um, Lydilentius cranate subspecies cranate that originates in Asia and is found on Japanese beach, Phagus cranata. However, it has co-evolved with that Japanese beach. It doesn't kill the Japanese beach. That Japanese beach has built up defenses where it's just a, a leaf damaging agent um, in that ecosystem. So we, we have lots of research going on to find its origin and also to find out more about why it's so virulent. We'll talk about that in a few more slides. So the infection court is the beach leaf bud, right? So it's only in the buds, and that's the only place that the beach can become infected. When the, and the, the nematode is limited to the leaves and the leafed buds only. It is not found in the wood of beach, in the roots, branches, twigs, and so on. It does not enter that tissue. So what we know, and we've more recently found out, is that it, the life cycle of the nematode, um, it, it's uh, the most active beginning in midsummer. 
Mo usually around the end of July, this time period starts and they're active until leaf off. This is the time period when the adult nematodes are leaving the leaf tissue in attempt to migrate to next year's leaf bud. It's a very important to understand this timing because it may help determine best treatment methods. We've also recently found out that this nematode can be carried down the canopy at this time of year. When the adults are escaping the leaf tissue, they can be flushed downwards by rainwater. So this may be why we're seeing the disease progression begin at the lower canopies and then further move upward. So in terms of moving upward, how does that happen? You know, how does how does the this even spread uh, laterally across our country, across the range of beach? Um, well, some research has been performed already, and we know that we have some long distance transmission pathways. Birds are to blame, which is one to blame that, that we already know about. There's many others that are very highly likely, but uh, the U.S. Forest Service has done studies and found that the um, many species of birds utilize beach, land in beach, eat beach buds, etc., and the nematode has successfully been transferred from canopies at, for over long distances because the birds can carry the nematode on their bodies. Um, more research is being done to find out if the nematode can be carried in their digestive tracts and successfully, you know, be alive out uh, once they're digested and passed through. Um, so in terms of closer transmission, for instance, canopy transmission or stand transmission, wind and rain has um, uh, been pinned as one of the major culprits. Now, researchers out of Penn State recently found that um, the nematodes, live nematodes can be um, found 40 feet away from an infected beach. Now, I know that they're doing more research to find out how how much further than 40 feet, but they, they, they looked at 40 feet as the furthest distance. And wind, and or rain can successfully move the nematode during that peak active time. So mostly in uh, August, September, and early October. Also, these same Connecticut researchers, um, Cantor and Goraya, they found out that the beach blight aphid, which is an aphid that we find often in um, beach dense woods and forests, they live on beach, don't really cause too much harm to beach, but they're part of the ecosystem. They can carry the nematode up and down branches in the trees. So this is one of the many potential culprits of how the nematode can be passed upwards rather than just the rain pushing it downwards. Also, the white mark tussock moth caterpillars can pass the nematode around. They can eat the nematode in the leaf tissue. The nematode can survive the complete digestion and excretion and then be passed into a different part of the canopy. So other likely vectors are, guess who? Us humans we probably are responsible for a lot of our long distance transmission or even short distance transmission. But since these are microscopic animals, we haven't detected this yet. Also, many other species of insects that live and uh, in on beach that utilize beach potentially could carry the nematode from canopy to canopy or from lower canopy to higher canopy, as well as many other species of wildlife. It is highly likely that there are multiple vectors and pathways of this nematode, including strong storms. So strong storms um, that potentially could uh, could even take more than just feet, maybe even miles. We don't know this yet, but our range map showed that uh, the the pattern of um, beach leaf disease spread is following our regular uh, weather patterns from west to east. So that being said, there are no quarantines in place. 
but it is best practice to not transport beach any longer. It, if you know of folks that move beach around, share this information. Let's not move plant material that is beach, um, especially from infected zones to non-infected areas, as well as beach parts and beach leaves. If we're having tree work done and the, the, the beach are actually being removed, anything's being chipped, any plant materials being disposed of, it's probably better to keep that plant material on site or at least keep it within a very short distance. What we also found out um, through lots of research, and I mean we in terms of scientists, I'm not doing this very highly specific research. The citations are below on this slide of these um, uh, scientists that, that study microbiology. So our nematode here, our beech leaf disease nematode might have um, allies that help to make them more virulent and more successful. So research has shown that mites have, are intertwined with the nematodes in infected leaf tissue. Also, there are the bacterial taxa in affected leaf versus um, uninfected leaves are very different. And highlighting that some of these bacterial communities may facilitate nem nematode feeding, nematode development, reproduction, and survival. That means their fitness could be increased by the bacterial tax that they harbor in these um, micro ecosystems, right? So they might be, eco these nematodes could be ecosystem engineers that promote their allies that um, make them more virulent. In the same way, fungal communities have been shown to be very different from um, infected versus unaffected leaves. So more research, of course, needs to be done. However, potentially even attacking through treatments, one of these uh, bacterial taxa or fungal communities might actually suppress nematode fitness and success. So it's important to understand the, e the micro ecosystems um, of the infected leaf tissue. So now what's at stake for New Jersey? Well, a lot. Our greenhouse and nursery stock, um, our ornamental beach, our cultivars, they, it, we're really in a lot of trouble here. And I know um, places that have been infected early on since 2020 up in uh, Northern New Jersey, We I know um, nursery owners that have just been throwing out their stock because they don't know what to do. It's really a choice of what's financially feasible and um, treatments may be too costly, as well as passing on a tree to someone to sell that's gonna require treatments potentially into perpetuity. So we're gonna be losing a lot of stock as well as for American beach, which is not as popular in the nursery trade, but it is grown for restorations. Now we can't really use it for restorations. We need other trees to restore the areas that are being affected by beech leaf disease. Our developed landscapes where we have our European beach cultivars in um, these settings, that shade and that ornamental value is also at risk. Likewise, our American beach in our small woodlots, the, their value, whether it's aesthetic or ecological value are at significant risk. And our large forest tracks, our entire ecosystems and forest health are at risk in New Jersey. These are critical ecosystem services. And now we're going to uh, shift and talk about the importance of American beach in New Jersey forests. So grab your teddy bear because they're all at risk. Okay, so just to review, what's the range of beach? Well, we know it's um, the eastern United States from the panhandle of Florida, um, up to Maine, into uh, southern Canada, and across the Mississippi, all the way over to Texas, to part of Texas. But in New Jersey, it occurs in each of the physiographic regions, all five of them. And we have multiple forest types that where beech is um, one of the climax species that is very commonly found. 
So in the northern part of the uh, New Jersey, we have our northern hardwood forests with beech, as well as our um, dry mesic oak uh, forests. And then in the southern half of New Jersey, in our inner coastal plain and outer, we have our coastal plain hardwood forest types. In general, we have um, we can call oak hickory hardwoods these uh, all these different forest types, and they take they occupy over eight hundred thousand acres in New Jersey. So the the and a lot of these acres contain beech. And one note is that beech really do not occur in the pure pinelands where pitch pine dominates and that is a completely different ecosystem. So that one area of our state, which is um, unique and, and wonderful, yet it does not contain beech as part of its uh, plant community. So just to review, it with for some or to share this uh, new concept forest succession is important to understand because a forest is not just a forest uh, um, of the current day it is it the forest changes over time and that long lifespan of the forest are hundreds of years so what i'd like to review with you is when forest succession starts, it starts after a disturbance or a clearing, whether it's man-made clearing or a storm or some sort of event. And then our primary successional forest uh, grows after we have, um, you know, gra mosses, grasses, and herbaceous plants and shrubs coming in first to set the stage. We then we get our primary succession trees. This first succession are trees that are short lived. And what I mean by short lived are 80 to 100 years. So it's long lived for humans, but it's short lived for trees. And these are fast growing trees that don't provide deep shade. They provide light shade and they grow in soils that are more disturbed and less uh, with less organic matter. But what they get to do is year after year, we don't have the leaf blowers in the woods blowing our leaves away. The leaf litter accumulates and creates organic matter, as well as the leaf litter during the growing season provides this light shade for the next succession. Now, our mid-succession species, for example, in a lot of New Jersey, you'll find oaks and hickory. Those are typical mid-succession species, along with our maples and, and um, like black birch, etc., they grow in the shade of our primary succession forest and they have a moderate growth rate and they do live rather long, especially oaks, right? But the other species in the mid succession are not as, as long lived as oaks. oaks. Some oaks can live up to about 300 or more years and um, the other species may live to about 150 or 200 years. But who grows in the shade of those mid-succession trees? Those are our climax species. Our climax species of New Jersey, and especially of central and northern New Jersey, are beech, sugar maple, yellow birch, and, well, birch occurs in these climax forests, but I'll just say they're short-lived, so let's delete that a little bit. That's, that's more of a... Um, straddles the line between mid-succession and climax, and hemlock. So we'll say hemlock and sugar maple in beech are our primary climax species. Now, we, if you're familiar, we're losing uh, uh, hemlocks, and we've lost many, most in our forests because of invasive insects. Sugar maple is moving northward and will, is predicted to move out of our state with climate change. Since we've discovered this situation with sugar maple, and since we've witnessed the loss of most of our hemlocks, beech have uh, been the stronghold of the climax forest condition. And it's important to have this climax forest condition because it, it is um, a higher quality forest. It provides 
many resources, not just for animals, wildlife, habitat, et cetera, et cetera, but also for us that I'm going to review. And the duration of its lifespan is very long. Beech can live three to 400 years. And they have a clonal growth pattern where the mother tree may die, but then the, the clonal saplings keep on growing and become mature trees. So potentially these beech can live even longer. And you can see on this succession timeline, our climax forest has the longest section. So if we lose that climax forest condition, we are shortening the timeline of our forests significantly. That means a, a faster disturbance pattern and more ability for, for example, invasion uh, with invasive plants. So let's move on to habitat provision. Beach provides so much habitat. We're going to go through a few slides. This slide is about all of the wildlife that utilize beach for forage. So um, beech nuts are favored over any oak acorn for with most wildlife that can actually chew beech nuts, even insects. Beech nuts provide pound for pound double the amount of protein than a white oak acorn. And they are the they are absolutely favored. It is very hard to find beech nuts in the forest because the wildlife are trying to get at it first. Also, the buds of beech are a food source for many species of birds. That also is a problem because of the vector scenario and the fact that buds can be infected and birds potentially can pass um, the nematodes to other forests. But in any case, it is an important food source and part of the diet of many species of birds. And just to note, our cute yellow-bellied sapsucker does utilize beech for um, uh, making its holes and sucking out sap. And yes, deer eat beech too. But yet, beech are less preferred than many of our other species. So we're losing one of the tree um, species that deer don't like to eat as much. And that's a shame because we, of course, you all know, we have way too many deer in New Jersey. So continuing on habitat, we have so many insects that utilize beech. There's probably many more that we don't even know about just because there hasn't been enough research. But thank goodness for the research that we have that's shown that there's over a hundred species of um butterfly and moth caterpillars that utilize beech. Some of them strictly use beech, like our uh, uh, white streak prominent, for instance, is, is one of them, I believe. And these caterpillars are, of course, vital for the diets of bird nestlings. So it's the, all of these insects are part of our greater ecosystem, and they're very important. Wood boring beetles, too. There's many of them utilize beech, leaf hoppers, and like I mentioned before, our beech blight aphid. What's cool about our beech blight aphid, it is part of our forested ecosystem, even though some may think it's a pest. And the honeydew that this aphid excretes is eaten by ants, wasps, and even the harvester butterfly. And what Interestingly enough, this harvester butterfly, the caterpillars of it, eat this aphid. So there's a cycle. And the, the excrement from this aphid um, produces a sooty mold. And there, the sooty mold has a fun name. It's called the beach aphid poop eater. And it reduces air pollution. So get that. We have all of, there's, there's even an ecological service provided by this. And then just to note, area fid mites, they cause in the ornamental trade cosmetic damage, but they don't do anything that significantly harms beach. They're one of our native mites that live on beach and they utilize beach. They cause no harm and they're part of the leaf ecosystem. I'm sure we have other higher order mites and arthropods that utilize these um, area fid mites as their a part of their diet. A very unique plant called beech drops, Epiphagus virginiana, 
requires beech. It is a uh, obligate root parasite of American beech, and it doesn't have chlorophyll. It's, it's a parasite. It can't produce its own chlorophyll, and that's why it's not green, and that's why in my on a amateur photo on the right in the woods, you can't see it. They look like little sticks on the ground in the leaf litter. So I circled them for you. And the um, that little dotted line I have circled when I was lucky enough to find a cute little bumblebee foraging in the forest. And I've found that bumblebees are a common forager of beech drops as well as other um pollinators of our forests and if you know anything about beach and beach forest beach don't are, provide so much deep shade which is a great ecosystem service but it makes it difficult for herbaceous plants that flower to get enough sun to flower especially in summer and early fall but beach drops are there and they don't need that 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 amount of light they need the beach and they provide these floral resources they also um help uh they provide these floral resources to ants ants cross pollinate these plants and they disperse the seeds so without beach we may not have beach drops any longer either so beach are very important um, in all landscapes for soil quality and habitat quality. The leaf litter of beech is very slow to decompose. It's high in lignans and it accumulates a thick layer. This thick layer is really important for maintaining moisture and cooler soil temperatures in um, the, the warmer months, as well as just regulating temperature protecting the soil in colder months it they it helps um this leaf litter helps to maintain soil quality as it slowly degrades and with its compounds it maintains an acidic ph this is very important for our forest because our forest species naturally need an acidic ph but as we know disturbances invasive plants they end up changing the soil chemistry and raising the pH of our four soils, which make it more difficult and more stressful for our native plants to survive. pH dictates the amount of which types of nutrients are available for these plants, and now our native species have evolved to have soil with an acidic pH. Also, this leaf litter helps to um, suppress the infiltration of invasive plants because it's so thick and takes so long to degrade. These are, the beech forests are the locations where you see the fewest invasive plants in, in general, let's just say. Um, and also it suppresses invasive worm activity. So if any of you are familiar with the invasive jumping worm and you try to leave your leaves, but all you have, for instance, may be maples or tulip or birch, your leaf litter is going to be eaten up so quickly and will not last through the growing season. But if you have beech and also oak have this property, they they it's very difficult for these worms to utilize these leaves and break them down. So it helps to suppress that invasive worm activity and the loss of leaf litter cover that they um, that happens when you have a, a large amount of invasive worms. So leaf litter is so important for our little critters. Uh, it, in addition to uh, moisture control, it provides protection and, for overwintering. Um, uh, places to hide and camouflage themselves. It might be difficult to see the little animals in these pictures without the red circles around them. And even larval hosting, some uh, insects require specific uh, leaf litter and specifically leaf litter to curl up in over winter, or many of our bees need to burrow under leaf litter into the soil to survive th um, through winter. And specifically that's our, our queen bees. So an, an interesting uh, aspect about beech, as well as oaks, is they exhibit marquescence. Marquescence is when the, um, the fall leaves that are already turned brown and no longer um, photosynthesized, 
they stay on the trees. You see this normally in the lower canopies, um, in the, the clonal groves or down in the lower branches or smaller trees when they're young. And sometimes you get lucky enough to see it when uh, uh, in a large tree. And for example, you could see here, I, I circled this um, great horned owl I found in the woods. Multiple days I found him in the same place in February. And he's getting some pr extra protection from winter winds by the marquesans in this tree. The lower canopy marquesans also offers some really nice um, shelter from uh, predators as well as uh, our, our weather in our colder months. So beech, as I just mentioned, they have um, our clonal sprouts. They have this habit of when a mother tree gets to a certain age, I don't mean that in any bad way, I mean it in a good way. And you can see in this photo, there's a, a larger thick stem in the background. That's the mother tree of this clonal grove full of abundant sprouts throughout and it's a wonderful place for camouflage as well as nesting and shelter. And specifically, just in, in the lower sapling air, the sapling canopy between about four feet and 10 feet is the favorite place for wood thrush to make their nests in beach. Where will wood thrush grow when we don't have these beach? I'm not sure, but they are very important for wood thrush as well as um, cover for many species of wildlife. Here's another photo of this uh, this clonal growth habit. And in addition to the habitat provision, it also uh, provides fantastic rain interception. So rain interception is an important ecological service that our, our forests provide, especially our intact forests that have multiple layers of vertical strata, meaning all of the ground uh, plants, as well as the seedlings, the saplings, the shrubs, the young trees and the older trees all the way up in the canopy have lots of leaves that block rain from rushing down too quickly and eroding leaf litter or soil, right? So leaf, a rain interception is really important to slow storm water and to, um, facilitate better water infiltration into the soil. And that means water storage and capture, right? The opposite of runoff. And you can see here in these winter photos on slopes, beach are doing the same thing. Now, one little aspect I failed to mention about uh, verbally, it was on the slide about the range, beach range from being living in uplands as well as lowlands. Now, up in the north, let's say north of New Jersey, say you get to the Adirondack area, beech are considered only a lowland species because it's a it's a different sort of um, scenario there where they have much taller mountains, they have different um, uh, climate, colder climates and such. But here in New Jersey, beech occur in our uplands, maybe not the tippy tops of our rocky summits as much as we find maybe our chestnut oak, but we'll find beach outside of wetlands in dry slopes, as well as moist slopes, toe slopes, riparian areas, and even in wetlands. Um, so they're providing soil as well as watershed protection by holding slopes. In, in addition to the rain uh, interception, they help the, this root system is shallow, but it's very prolific and it helps to hold the soil on the slopes. The, one, the, the greatest pollutant to our water bodies is sediment, and that's from land use due to human activity. So beach and their growth habit help to um, uh, prevent the negative aspects of, of soil loss. So more about our waterways. Now we have what are called category one waters designated throughout New Jersey. And you can see them here uh, on the map in purple. Um, beach are a major component of the forests that shade these category one waters, not the ones so much along the coast. So let's not um, point to those, but 
Look at all of those category one waters in the northern half of the state or the ones in Monmouth County. A lot of these areas have beach and category one waters are of a high quality, have a high ecological value, have a high aesthetic value. They um, uh, harbor endangered and threatened species. They're important for our water supplies and especially our cold water fisheries. Beach shade these areas. And you can see here at the photo on the right, this is, this is beach shading a category one waterway. They hang over the streams. If we lose the beach and these canopies and these gallery forests, that's another name for riparian forests along streams, we're going to be losing that climate control and potentially the temperatures will go up and potentially we will lose the quality of these cold water fisheries, maybe the quality of these habitats and the ability, for instance, for trout to be uh, living successfully in our native ecosystems. Now, here's just a couple photos of um, some more beach in Here's our uh, tributary of a Passaic, which is uh, right along the boundary of uh, Morris County and Somerset. And beach also live in many of the seeps that feed into these uh, category one waterways. For instance, you can see the photo of this sphagnum moss among beach and oak leaf litter and the little yellow trout lily uh, leaves. So and as I mentioned, the climate protection for our, our class one, our category one waterways are very important. But in general for New Jersey, we need as much shade as possible, especially in our hot summer months, even in forest tracks to help um, mitigate climate impacts, to help provide cooling, to help also um, with carbon capture. And we're gonna be losing, we're gonna be impacting these important um, ecological services. So as we lose beach canopy, what will happen? Well, we know with recent research that with overabundant deer eating our native um, trees and seedlings, and we have invasive plants, when we have canopy gaps and we lose large trees without any intervention, we're stuck in a bad situation where we're likely going to be having invasive plants take over. And the current state of our canopy gaps are like these, uh, right here where we have the major foes. The, here's a trio of multiflora rose, barberry, and wineberry. They're widespread common invasive of our forest and especially more taller more um, uh, prolifically reproducing and thicker in our canopy gaps. Here's some new emerging species that um, do much better in a canopy gap situation like Photinia bullosa or Seibold viburnum. And so let's just review. Uh, we have many ecosystem services at risk there are shading and cooling benefits, the loss of our climax forest, a reduced capacity for watershed function, category uh, one stream ecosystems, potential habitat decline, and a, a stress to our forested ecosystems and our wildlife that depend on beach. The loss of beach nuts will be um, very stressful, as well as the capacity for um, shelter, larval hosting, and our um, habitat and soil and just forest overall quality. So each of these aspects combined will um, cascade into further unseen impacts. And we don't know if the sun is setting on beach, but let's hope not. However, we have to prepare if it is. So... I'm going to switch gears into uh, treatment options, and I just wanted to ask the host if we have any pertinent questions, um, if we wanted to uh, review. Thank, thank you, Jean. Um, very clear, because there are very few questions. Uh, there is a question about treatment, but I think we'll wait until after that segment for okay. you to 
respond to that. But the other question asks whether beech trees are monoecious. Do they self-pollinate or must they cross-pollinate? You referred to mother trees. Can all beech trees form colonies? So um, they are monoecious. They 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 don't they don't require cross pollination, but it is a good thing to have because then you know we have more genetic diversity. So they do both, um, but they're they're not dioecious. So uh, American beech notably uh, make clonal groves, and at by a certain age they normally do. We. I don't know, and I don't know if anyone knows if there are certain triggers of why um, some beach may do this more than others. It might just be site suitability um, for that for that specific tree, but it it is in general any tree may be able to do this. Um, that's a, an American beach. Now I haven't seen the clonal groves occur with European beach, but also they're typically in developed settings where there's mowing and maintenance and, and it, I'm not sure if they clonally sprout or if they do as prolifically as American beach do in our forests. So um, I I think thank I you. answered the question. Thank you. Yes, thank you very involved. much. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. Well, I'm going to move on now to treatments and hopefully that, that next question will be um, answered. And if not, we can we can answer it at the end. So there's a lot of um, uh, trial. There are a lot of trials going on, and we're getting progress. You know, month by month. Um, I'm oh, I've been giving this talk, and every time I gave it, I have to update it with new information, which is good because we have so many researchers working on this. It is such an important topic. Um, trials are ongoing, and I'm going to review these four different um, treatment uh, options and the trials that have occurred or have not um, with uh, the, the options here. So we'll start with polyphosphite 30. Now, um, polyphosphite 30 was uh, uh, tested by Davy Tree in Cleveland Metro Parks. And it is a product that is, uh, it's, a, it's in a fertilizer. It's in a potassium phosphate fertilizer by the plant food company. Now this other phosphate fertilizer is an alternative to use. It's very similar in composition. You do not need a pesticide license to apply this. You just need to be able to buy that fertilizer and apply it safely. So the trial, um, what they used was the polyphosphate 30 on pole size beach. So they did use it on small beach. They are There is a trial right now, but we don't know the results of mature beach but they did pole size beach two to four inches. They um, did application twice per year, one month apart during the growing season between May and August. And they did this for five years. After five years, the trees were healthier, right? Um, they had fewer uh, nematodes in the treated um, leaves, in, in the treated trees. So there were fewer nematodes in those leaves. Now, I, I, I highlighted below, with, surrounded in blue, um, the, a really good uh, um, resource for more information on how to apply this. This is where I got this information from Heather Faubert's Speech Leaf Disease Treatment Update, and she's from the University of Rhode Island. But this is straight out of her update, and this is the application rate two fluid ounces of the phosphite fertilizer plus 14 ounces of water per one inch dbh now they suggest and all of these details are they start to get a little confusing so that in more depth are in this resource if the tree is large you might have to up the rate of the phosphite um, fertilizer so it's suggested that for every doubling of dbh greater than four inches so say for instance the next doubling would be eight you would need to times the phosphate amount by 1.5 and you have to make sure to increase the application area to the drip line the problem with this is is 
potentially, and we don't know this yet because we don't have proof from the, the trials, but we do sus people do suspect that you can over fertilize if you're pouring a lot of this stuff for a large beach and there could be a salt overload injury. So that's um, the trouble of treating large beach in this capacity. Another thing to think about is just the amount of uh, phosphate you're pouring into a system. Um, we don't know how this affects, uh, or, or this. well, we do know how phosphorus affects waterways. And we know a lot of beach uh, live near waterways. So it may not be the best scenario for people who are trying to protect their beach that live near water bodies because they may end up inadvertently increasing the potential for eutrophication of that water body. So, but just getting back, I'll review the procedure if this uh, scenario is suitable for you. The way that this is applied is first you move the leaf litter away from the treatment area. Now, this picture only shows really close to the root flare. However, best practice is moving the leaf litter all the way out to the drip line of the tree. That's the total distance all the way to the tips of the, the, the lateral branches. Then that area where the leaf litter is moved, you moisten the soil, you um, apply uh, the product without touching the roots or the tree, and then you put the leaf litter back. Now, supposedly, a similar product that is used um, commonly for beach to treat fungal issues are like phosphite fungicide products. And in theory, all are known to stimulate plant defenses. So for example, these products are Agrifrost or Reliant, and they're commonly used to treat bleeding canker. And you can apply them as a bark spray, and they can even be used as a foliar spray to treat foliar um, fungal issues. Um, they must be used according to the label. However, even though in theory they do the same thing and in anecdotal evidence against beach leaf disease, we've seen an improvement of health and vigor of the beach. There have been no um, trials to date and we don't know if it actually is effective for against BLD or it just helps to boost the health of the beach. We suspect it just helps to boost, boost the health of the beach, but we still don't know by how much. So next is fluoropyram. Fluoropyram is also uh, a fungicide. Now, Bartlett did trials with the Connecticut um, Agricultural Experiment Station, and they did uh, foliar applications of indemnify, four of them starting right at the end of July. That's that second half of the growing season, right? That's the beginning. Now, fluoropyram, just to know, is also a product, is also um an active ingredient in broad form and Luna experience. So their first foliar application, and this was in a lab, was successful. The treated leaves had a decreased number of nematodes as well as decreased number in treated buds. Now they tested Indemnify, which is an agricultural product against broad form. Now broad form is the only ornamental use product, meaning for forests or for developed landscapes that can be used um, to treat beach. So there was no difference and they wanted to test this because there's a little bit less fluoropyram in broad form. So in any case, there was no significant difference. So they went ahead with broad form trials in the real uh, forest setting and they started again um at the mid to well in this this scenario they started in mid july instead of late july they did four applications 21 days apart and the results were mixed and they're mixed for a few reasons now the the successes included beach that weren't in dense beach stands and ones that were younger and smaller Right. So that means that they probably had better coverage of a foliar ap application, while the failures were dense beach dominant forests and tall, mature beach trees. Therefore, if you wanted to go the fluoropyram route, um, good candidates include beach with minimal dieback, beach hedges, small beach uh, to medium beach specimens, 
and mixed forest, not dense, uh, not for not beach in dense beach forest because there's so much what's called inoculum. Uh, that's what that's what people call it when so many nematodes so there are more nematodes that can rain down in these dense beech forests and especially when we can't reach the tops of the tall beech trees in those forests and importantly fluoropyrim cannot be used near water so the poor candidates are the exact opposite of what i just described Beach with substantial dieback, beach with um, in, in that are infected with other diseases, tall can or large beach where you can't even reach the canopies, like in this photo, um, beach dominant forests and beach near water bodies. But guess what? We have another, and I think this is the right now the um best method we have so far. So. When I first was giving the, was giving this talk, we weren't allowed to use this product yet. Thibendasol, which is called Arbortec uh, 20S, that's um, the that's what's on. Uh, I'm sorry, that that's what this product is called. But Thibendasol is the active ingredient. It is a systemic fungicide, and this fungicide was used originally to treat Dutch elm disease and sycamore sycamore anthracnose. Um, it has just become available uh, in late October of last year for um, use to treat beech leaf disease. And it's applied once every other year. Now, we know this from trials that are ongoing, but we already have one year's worth of data that is very good. So in 2022, Bartlett researchers um, used they trialed the uh, thibendasol on beach that were between 10 inches and 22 inches dbh so that's nice because they're mature beach they're not just small pole size they injected it um uh this product to the sides of the root flares because injecting in the trunk of beach may damage beach beach are not that great at what's uh compartmentalization which is in essence how um trees handle wounds so targeting the site of the root flare is much safer and they did one treatment in early august and we had really good results 80 percent reduction of the lcm and dormant buds reduced canopy symptoms by 50 percent and they completely prevented dieback so there's really some hope in thibendasol and then new research is suggesting that um, the application can be done in may to june before the nematodes start leaving the leaves so this could completely uh, um, replace the fluoropyrum schedule, which is very intensive. The fluoropyrum schedule is four sprays over, um, a, you know, complete foliar sprays over uh, a few months. And that could add up and become very expensive. Thibendasol, on the other hand, is one treatment every other year. So that lowers the cost. And in addition, we have many beach by waterways and you can use thibendasol near um, uh, waterways, on beach near waterways. It doesn't harm waterways whatsoever. So next we'll quickly talk about Kytosan. Kytosan is a newer sort of um, uh, product out there. Kytocure is one of the, the, um, the products from the ICT brand. There's other um, brands that offer Kytosan products. It's an organic product. It is known to treat successfully the root knot nematode. However, we do not know if it works on beech leaf disease yet. So um, we're hoping that trials uh, will begin and then we'll understand the efficacy. But just to let you know, this is also a foliar spray. So it does. It is intensive, and it does. It, it is difficult to get um, any product up into tall, large beach canopies. So now we're going to jump to um, situations for uh, land management. What we can do, because some people can't treat, and and also um, treatments can be very costly, especially for larger beach. So for early infections, you can postpone 
beech leaf disease, you're not preventing beech leaf disease from coming from pruning. However, if you do minor pruning here and there of of infected leaves, if you just have a new infection starting, you may help to postpone, uh, unfortunately, the inevitable. And if you prune the leaves, also prune the buds near those leaves. Um, dispose of the this in the trash, not in compost. Now, what about lower canopy removal, right? So we think the nematodes get flushed down into lower canopies. Well, there is anecdotal evidence that have it, the trees that were before beech leaf disease hit had the lower canopies removed for other reasons, more mostly to get let light in to the understory. Um, and the, the beech leaf disease symptoms weren't found in those upper canopies and they lack the lower canopy to be infected. But beech are not good at healing their wounds. All pruning can it is is an injury to a tree any sort of pruning so the if you're removing large limbs that's a large wound and it's a big stress so stressing a tree that may already be infected is not a good idea so i would not recommend pruning mature trees just um, for bld prevention or postponement so next, let's talk about ways to protect beech, but also these are ways to protect all trees. And the, the reason we wanna protect them is because we want their defenses to be as high as possible. Just like humans, trees can have um, their immunity lowered because they're stuck in bad situations. Like if we fall in a cold pool, we might catch a cold, right? Or if we go out without our jacket, or if we're um, in a scenario where uh, we could potentially get a uh, hurt or cut or infection, right? Where our defenses could be lowered, um, even having stress, even if it's mental stress, physical stress, your def your immunity can be lowered with, not with mental stress, but for, for physical stress with beach and other trees, their, their immunity and their ability to fight um, diseases is lowered by having stress. So to reduce stress, we wanna not do construction near beach um, or avoid machinery for tree work near the beach. We don't wanna mow over the root systems and mowing compacts soil and it physically damages surface roots. So it's best to remove grass, um, to, you know, lawn grass from around trees. Now, just to explain this a little further, Soil compaction um, reduces the pore spaces. Half of soil are air or pore spaces that when it rains, fill with water. And if those pore spaces are squashed, the roots that require oxygen are not getting it and they require water fundamentally and they're not getting it. And then the, the soil has the inability to store that water because it doesn't have the, the, the spaces in those, uh, the pore spaces available. Furthermore, you can see this uh, visual comparison of the amount of roots found under lawn grass versus under mulch. So you have more fine roots that are able to um, absorb water and minerals under mulch versus grass. Grass suppresses that. Irrigating and fertilizing grass will not benefit trees or shrubs because the grass is using all of that up and it's not getting down into the deeper levels where the tree needs it, right? So it, it turf grass underneath trees is very detrimental and stressful. So in this situation, here's a mature beach in an urban area and look at there's grass everywhere, no mulching, no nothing. And just a note, it doesn't have to be mulch. You can plant native plants, and they're not going to compete with that. That with um uh for for water like the turf grass does. So, planting a bed of native plants below beach is a much better scenario, as well as leaving the leaves. But in any case, this whole entire area should not have grass below the beach if if the property owner is concerned with the health of that tree. Furthermore, let's not do any of these crazy things to beach or trees 
Just like beech leaf disease is a terrible disease across New Jersey, but so is volcano mulching. And it's all over the place and we really got to stop doing it. And let's not pile rocks against root flares. I see that way too often, as well as accidental girdling because those ties on the stakes sometimes don't get removed. In addition to what I just mentioned, it is so important to water during droughts. If you think, oh, your old trees are fine because they're established, they are very susceptible to stress from drought and heat. We, the, when you water trees, you need to water two gallons per one inch DBH. So if you have a big tree, that's a lot of water and you got to water at the drip line and at the base of the trees. And it's really important also to remove invasive plants nearby beach through, because through their competitive mechanisms, they can stress out beach. We know that there are a lot of in, invasives that um, have potential allelopathy. One known allelopathic tree that harms beach, and we know it, is tree of heaven. Uh, we know barberry alters soil and um, by elevating the pH, and that can be stressful to beach, as well as what Norway maple does, water hogging or creating excessive shade. So here's just a little picture of beach across the river. And when we start losing that beach, the barberry at the doorstep is likely to just jump right across. So if you have invasions near your beach that you're going to be losing, please do the best you can to remove those invasive plants. Now, the, these are the last couple slides I'm about to finish up, and this is one of the most important things we can do um, in general for any trees we're losing, including beech, as well as the ash we've lost or other trees in, um, that we're losing in our landscapes. We need to proactively plant with native cohort trees. I'm going to share two slides of species lists in a moment, and but what I want to review is that Local porogeny is best. It's best to use local ecotypes. It's best even if you have the ability to collect seed and grow from the seed uh, of trees that grow alongside those beech in that local ecosystem. Those genetics are important to preserve. It's That is best practice. Um, New Jersey, just a New Jersey ecotype is still good practice. We want to plant dense stands, not just a tree or two. We don't need one little tree trying to replace what a 30-inch beech was doing ecologically. We need 30 little trees to replace that. And we can do three to six foot spacing, depending on the species of trees. Now, we must prevent deer damage. Wire mesh is the best option, and we need to go six feet with that wire mesh. Deer are taller than four feet and too, uh, too much of our barrier protections are only four feet tall. So just uh, to review, when you have a small seedling, it is best to use a, um, a wider, wider mesh, wire mesh scenarios so your seedling can branch out a little bit. Those tubelings used for reforestation, the I mean the tubes, not the tubelings, the tubes, those white tubes used for reforestation, they're a good bang for your buck, but they really disable the um, the seedling from having uh, some canopy development that's a little wider, and they don't um, offer any rain interception as an ecological service when they're a younger seedling. And we also want to make sure when uh, to prevent buck rub. So when the trees are taller, you can reduce that cage if you like, and then make sure it cover uh, um, protects your stems. Smaller stock is key. This is really, really important to understand. Most people think the bigger you plant something, the better and the healthier it'll be. For trees, this is the complete opposite. If you plant a one gallon of, of uh, a, a tree and then the same exact species, a bound and burlap two inch caliper tree, that one gallon is going to grow faster. It's going to grow taller very quickly, probably within three to four years, will surpass the the B and B tree. And it's going to be healthier for its entire lifetime. It's going to require less treatments, if at all any treatments, and it's going to suffer much less transplant shock. So and it will live a longer life with fewer disease issues. So if we're looking to reforest, 
Going small is the best and it's the best for your wallet. It's also something we need our green industry partners to work on and it is a very good opportunity for our commercial growers. We really need more of these trees in New Jersey to offer up for reforestation of all landscapes, not just forests, not just rural suburbs, as well as our urban forests. And I'm not really talking about planting stands along streets because that doesn't make sense. But we do have small forest fragments in our urban areas that really need some help. So I'm going to show you two slides. One are the beech tree cohort species of northern New Jersey. The only um, species I left off this list that are current cohort cohorts are a red oak group species, and that's because they have a much higher susceptibility for bacterial leaf scorch as well as oak wilt. So um, let's stick to the white oak group. Oaks are important, and so are hickories. That's why I made them the biggest on this list. The others listed here that are very important are, for example, our black gum, because they also clonally sprout. They can physically um, try to, uh, you, we can kind of replicate a little bit of what beech does with black gum. However, black gum doesn't sprout as prolifically. Um, American holly is another great option because we have evergreen cover and they're slow growing with lots of leaves for rain interception. Now noted here, you can see the, the blue um, species on uh, this, the, this slide, and these are the species that do not belong in the southern half of New Jersey because of climactic reasons. Now I'll switch um, to our southern New Jersey list, and that's here, and you can see I, the additions for southern New Jersey are in red, and to note, I added sweet gum to this list because in northern New Jersey, natural the, the range of sweet gum that is natural are only flat wood flood plains that are by um, large rivers. Like we could say where the Passaic is um, wide and large, you might find uh, um, sweet gum in those forests. However, sweet gum are not part of uh, our beach for our forest ecosystems that have beach in them, but Suikam is heavily planted throughout New Jersey and it prolifically spreads outside of this forest type where it belongs. So that's one little specific about Suikam. But I hope you got a screenshot of this slide. And then now we're on our last slide. And there's two things before questions that I want I, I want to share. One is this lower photo is of a beach mitigation planting project in Morris County, in Lewis Morris County Park. And I want to thank Morris County Parks and the Natural Resource Management Division, especially Superintendent uh, Daryl Jones. We're um, collaborating together to test this mitigation strategy in a forest setting. And we have four plots where across those we've planted 585 species of native cohort um, trees and shrubs. Now, this is kind of what it would look like when you're individually caging each tree. Uh, and then this QR code, please, please, please scan this QR code or you can save it for later and take a screenshot. I need evaluations because yes, I am a Rutgers faculty, but I am on a tenure track. I'm not yet tenured. So I really need to collect positive feedback and that will help me during my reappointment process greatly. If you didn't like this talk, you, you don't have to take the evaluation, but I really need positive impact shown in these evaluations. So if you if you have uh, an extra two minutes, if you can please um, give me some positive feedback, I greatly appreciate it. Um, and thank you so much, um, Somerset Native Plant Society, for having me come out to speak about this really important issue. And I'm I'm happy to take any more questions. Thanks so much, Jean. Um, there are a lot of questions that. Um... Okay. Allow me to understand that what you spoke about was very, very clear because the questions are very, very pointed. So um, some of them relate to treatment. Uh, will the treatment of beech trees harm the animals that use it for a food source? And can the nematode live on the tools like wood chippers and trimmers that you might use to, to cut down the trees or trim the trees? Um. So we can just think that the nematode during their active 
time might be able to live on like to be carried on anything we don't know yet how long they can live um before they reach the bud so yes cleaning machinery and cleaning tools is important um and potentially treatments such as um the 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 foliar fluoropyram that could harm animals and we don't know right that might harm animals the more organic option is the chitosan as a foliar application the um potas the the not potassium the phosphite fertilizer that may not directly harm any wildlife with beach, it might change soil microbes in the soil. We don't know, but it could, if it's applied too heavily, it could harm uh, uh, any sort of, any waterways just because of the increase of phosphorus. Thibendazole, we do not know if it can harm um, anything because it is a fungicide, but it is, it's being injected into the tree. So we suspect it is not harmful to anything else. However, we don't know the intricacies of um, uh, of anim wildlife utilizing, for instance, the nuts for forage, and if that harms, if if having a, a tree treat uh, treated with thibendazole and having nuts there and having wildlife eat it, is that safe? Right. That's the main question. So. We don't know this, but we assume it is safe because it's a fungicide. So it's meant to kill fungus. It's not really, it, it's not a stronger uh, pesticide that is harmful to insects or um, plants. I mean, not plants. I, I mean, humans or, or uh, mammals or birds, for instance. So um, that's what we suspect. But again, we need more trials to find out. Um, just my, my opinion is thibendazole is probably one of the, the, the best options because of it's uh, the least impactful to the ecosystem because it doesn't leach out and it's a fungicide just meant to uh, attack fungus and somehow it ends up reducing the nematode numbers significantly. Thank you. So the next question, if the beech leaf disease vector is a nematode and treatments are fungicides, um, is it, is, are the treatments working to interfere with the relationship between the nematode and the fungus? Potentially, yes. And I don't, I don't know if anyone exactly knows why the, this fungicide has nematicidal effects. Um, I, I'm sure that researchers are looking into this, and that's why um, that that slide about virulence that I was talking about, and how the fungal communities are very different when once the the leaf becomes infected with nematodes, and so potentially um, we're disabling that beneficial connection for the nematodes and making it much harder for the nematodes to uh, um, succeed. So that's my educated guess but I'm sure researchers are looking into it, but we don't know def definitely either way. Okay, thank you. Another question is, um, are the people researching a solution in the US in touch with the countries in Asia that are also dealing with this problem? Uh, is Asia in touch with any countries that they got it from? Maybe they have more experience in what That's works. Yes, so researchers around the world are communicating about beech leaf disease. Beech leaf disease is entering Europe as well, right? European beech are susceptible. So um, we assume that this nematode subspecies arose from uh, Asia. However, we don't really know the origin yet, so we can't really even suspect which country or region it, it came from, just knowing that we just assume it's alien to the United States and Canada, to the range of American beach. Um, we also assume it's alien to the range of European beach because it's highly virulent in European beach as well. So, um, but we are 
researchers are communicating and we're trying to figure this all out. Okay, thank you. The next question is fluoropyram and thiabendazole going to wipe out the micro rhizi near the tree? That's a really good question. So the my mycorrhizae are really important and that potentially it could, and that's why we need more studies. The fluoropyram less likely. Um, well, actually I can't say that. I don't know the likelihood. Fluoropyram being a foliar spray, I just find that we know that, you know, it is toxic to humans it's probably not the best case scenario uh, environmentally, even though it might be effective um, for the treatment of beech leaf disease in specific um, sites. But thibendazole, from what I understand, is that it doesn't leave the, the beach. However, within the rhizosphere, we don't have any studies yet to know if it impacts any mycorrhizal benefit. So that's a really good question, and I wish I knew that answer because I'm all about mycorrhizae. <laughs> okay, so more to follow there. Yeah. So the next question, I'm in a neighborhood with many beech trees. I'm the only one who has been treating with uh, the phosphate treatment, about $900. I guess that's annually. Mm -hmm. So the question is, if my neighbors don't treat, am I wasting my money? Well... Um, that's a really good question and it's very site specific. So you're, it, it's more what the goal is of what you, what, what you're trying to do, because you just think, okay, there's a lot of inoculum out there if everyone is beach, right? And if you're the only one treating regardless, that means you're going to be treating into perpetuity. I would highly suggest switching to thibendazole. And I imagine that if you're working with a licensed tree expert, a lot of companies are now switch will be switching this coming year to using thibendazole because once it, we're in the growing season, we're going to have a second year's worth of data. And the, I imagine it's going to be successful since we had such success in the first year. So to save money, you might want to switch to thibendazole, but... Um, and that might offer better protection than the polyphosphate 30 fertilizer because the polyphosphate 30 fertilizer only improves the health of beech, but it doesn't really fight the nematode. I okay, hope that thank the you. Question. Mm -hmm. um, so then there were another set of questions. Uh, one is um, how big should a beech runner be before I try to replant it in a different location? Um, do you, what do you mean by beach runner? Do you mean like a clonal sprout? Yes, probably. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know the answer to that. I feel like that's an experiment and it's not, doesn't just have to do with the length of the root. I think it has to do with the time of the year, your soil quality, your soil pH, uh, the climate, you know, if you're doing any sort of transplanting, you want to do this at um, like November, the end of fall, early winter, and you, you want to, you know, carefully take care of your plant. So there's a lot of other variables, um, and rather than the, the length of, of the root, but of course, having a better root system is going to make it a, a more intact root system is going to likely, um, be more successful of a transplant. Okay, thank you. So the next question, since New Jersey forestry will not have trees this year, and I assume that's beech trees this year, is there another source you recommend for bare root trees to plant? Oh, that's a really good question. And I um, actually would have to look that up because I don't have it at the, the tip of my brain, but there is a native resource that I Googled specifically for a consult just a couple days ago, and I can't remember their name. So you, I have my email on this slide. You can shoot me an email and then I can provide you that resource. And I, I found that they were wholesale native tree seedlings. So, um, and they're for, suitable for the mid-Atlantic. 
Okay, thank you. Another question, is there a need to report sightings of beech leaf disease, I guess, as we did with spotted lanternfly for a while, uh, um, to an agency, or is it not necessary because it's already everywhere within New Jersey? Um, so the thing is, we suppose it's everywhere in New Jersey, but actually the the southern counties of New Jersey are not showing on in the range yet, right? I suspect they have it but it's just probably not as prevalent. So in the counties that already have beech leaf disease anywhere, don't feel the need to report it. But if if you're if you feel if you're in the the deep south of New Jersey and you find beech leaf disease, I would highly recommend calling the New Jersey Forest Service and letting them know. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I think uh, we're getting down to the last questions. Ooh. Are the beech tree uh, cohort list available somewhere on the Rutgers website, or is there a link for them? And if not, uh, I, I think this individual would like to go back to those two slides to take sure. a screenshot. Um, so here's the Northern list. And the thing is, I have made a flyer um, and I can email it to you. So you should also screenshot that last slide. And the flyer is specific for the northern half of New Jersey. So it has these trees on it. And it actually has all of the specs I recommended with the wire mesh and the small stock and all of that. I I am planning to make that into a Rutgers fact sheet, but it's not online yet. So that's soon to come. But again, you can feel free to email me and please um, share these lists. And I just want to also note that Ecologically, we don't really have as much of a central Jersey as we do politically. So I know Somerset would be considered central Jersey, but if it's not um, coastal plain soils, we're still northern ecologically. So I believe if you're in summer, if this question is coming from someone in Somerset, this northern list is what you're looking for. Um, and I'll I'll move back just in case to I hope this person got a chance to screenshot this. But I'll, I want to go back to the um, the last slide, so anyone that needs can um, shoot me an email. And please take my email. Okay, uh, he he got it. He got the screenshots. Okay, good. Um, another question: Have we found any resistant beech trees, or beech trees that are resistant to beech Not tree yet. disease? We haven't. Uh, there hasn't. I don't know if people are have been adequately searching um because but as far as I know we don't we don't have any resistant populations. It's really wiping through um and and that's that's to note that that's why we think that we believe the 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 nematode is exotic because the our beach have no defenses. Okay, so I think we have um, two more questions. Okay. Uh, is anyone studying treating the endosymbiotic Wolbachia in the ne nematodes? Yeah, I haven't, I have not um, uh, uh, found any any trials or, or, or studies on that yet, but I imagine folks might be working on that and seeing if they can attack the bacteria that's an endosymbiont so um i hope that i I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that but i haven't heard anything okay so a couple more things do you know anything about a japanese landscaper who invented mini forests um is that that's the tiny forest um initiative Yes, I, I know, I do know about that. And it's just a planting strategy, kind of similar to the dense planting strategy that I suggest. Um, and uh, I, I am familiar with that planting technique. Yes. And do you remember his name? Um, I think it's, it's, you know, I do confuse it with Miyazaki because that's my favorite um, animator, but I think it's Miyawaki or Mia, so, something very similar to Mia, Mia, Miyawaki. I can't recall at this moment, but it's something that will be 
on Google. <laughs> okay, very good. So then the last uh, question is just about um, the link to your evaluation. Yes. Um, code. So this individual is saying she's having problems uh, with the evaluation with the QR code. So I'm just wondering if that's something, Val, that we would be able to support sending out. Uh... I have a link that is actually a clickable link. It just wouldn't be through Zoom. So I can share that with Val to send out um, when we send out the recording link. Or you can email me too, and I can send you a link. So I really appreciate you wanting to take my email. So thank you. We'll okay. get you. We'll get this person a link. Okay. And so we have a few people online who have mentioned that it's Miyazaki, M I Y A Z A K I method. That's the the mini tree uh, method that we were talking about. Yeah. It. it it's, I think it's really similar to Miyazaki, but in, in any case, yes, that's close. But it, the tiny forest, you can find a lot by just um, searching tiny forests. Okay, very good. So um, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. It stimulated a lot of questions.